And, all right, the recording. And uh, due to the governor's statewide disaster declaration relating to the COVID-19 pandemic and current public health guidelines for social distancing, we have determined that it is not prudent for the members of the Economic Development Commission or staff to convene in person for this morning's meeting. Therefore, the members of the CDC are attending this meeting by video conference. Those same conditions require barring access to the public for in-person attendance. In light of those limitations, the public has been invited to attend and listen to the meeting through Zoom platform or by phone, as indicated on the meeting agenda. To comply with the Open Meetings Act requirements for virtual meetings, this meeting, morning's meeting is being recorded. So the first order of business is roll call. Can we check off who's here, Pam? Yeah, uh, Mina. I'm here. Jay Levin. Here. Michael Elliott. I'm here. Rowan Steinberg. Here. Roger. I'm here. That's as good as it gets. All right. Um, the minutes have been circulated and there will be hopefully a chance to look at them. Are there any uh, amendments, suggestions, additions to the minutes, subtractions? Uh, just in terms of the agenda, Roger, it's uh, the approval of minutes from April 27th. It says the 13th. But... Thank you. So the 13th has been approved already. <laughs> We're doing the 27th. Is there a motion? I move, I move to approve, approve the minutes. I I'll second. Approved. Second. Uh, any opposed? No opposition. The minutes are approved. So we have. Um, a pretty busy morning. We've got two guests this morning, as everybody knows, and we've got some other things to take care of. So we're going to kind of intersperse the, the guests and the discussions that we have to work through. Um, first item is the, the how'd you do it videos. We had, I think some, uh, or some, how are we doing with getting more people to participate? I've uh, contacted Marion Ward from Within Reach and uh, Eric Waller from Signature Popcorn, and I'm waiting to hear from them. So nothing firmed up yet. You know, one thing I wanted to mention, um, Roger, I'd sent something around um, yesterday about uh, the Lake County Partners Municipal Meeting that's going to be tomorrow. Mm -hmm. At 11:30, and its focus is on retail. I, we sent the link around and, you know, anyone's free to register for that meeting. Um, we were invited by Barbara Priscilla of um, Lake County Partners, and it is retail focused. They're going to have three panelists. Um, Jason Gustafson, he's a principal with Stone Real Estate, and uh, his uh, expertise is in leasing. So that could be interesting. And Matt Tilton from, he's a senior vice president at First Midwest Bank. And his focus is retail, uh, multifamily, industrial retail and mixed use financing. And uh, also Brandon Speck, he's a research analyst with CoStar. So um, anyone who, I, I, I'll try to attend, but all are invited. Yeah, it, it's we were saying yesterday. It's it's a good opportunity to to gather intelligence for the trustees in a situation where they've got enough mm -hmm. things to do that expecting one of them to burn out those two hours is. You know, I'll, I'll, so hopefully somebody can. I may even register myself. See if I can get in there. But uh, if you can carve out a little bit of time and see what's going on. It, would be really useful, interesting to hear back as to just what their ideas were about what's going on now. Um, we talk about this a lot in terms of what's what's to come and uh, how Long Grove should position itself for that. <coughs> Pardon me. Um, 
the customer relations software situation looks like it's made some progress. Uh, Mike, uh, Erwin, you have some thoughts? Mike, yeah, so maybe you can talk Irwin about the CRM. Yeah. Yeah, Erwin put together a nice uh, list of nice list of questions uh, that we can ask that would get us some basic information to load into CRM. And then um, I just typed those up and submitted them and they were part of the uh, invitation that was sent around. Um, I don't know if anybody has any input, but I, it's pretty basic, right? I don't think we need to spend too much time unless someone has something obvious that we missed. Uh, we're happy to add that. Um, I just, what I didn't know was how are we going to move forward with CRM? Obviously, HubSpot is free. We just need to set it up. Um, are, is someone going to be an administrator for that? Or are we all just going to um, figure out how to enter data, which I believe with HubSpot, any of us can sign up as a user. Uh, I, have to, I have to double check uh, how many seats we get on the free license. Um, it may be limited, but uh what's everyone's thoughts on do we want to funnel all the information to one person to enter into hubspot or do we each want to enter our own information it's not that much so it won't be that much for someone to enter the data in um but once we decide on that you know i'm happy to move forward setting it up uh i just don't know you know if, if there's anything we need to do considering we're setting setting it up for the edc and for the village not not for you know an individual business Any thoughts, anybody? I, I had two things. One was that I really liked the list because it, it, it firmed up my thinking anyway in terms of what you do when somebody calls. I know the last time I had a call, it was like, oh, what, what, do, I, what do I say other than, hi, can I help you? What do you want? Uh, and and <laughs> having the prompt to, to, to ask those questions would have been a, a help for me anyway. Um, so I think that's great, but I'd like to see uh, a buy-in from the village employees as well, because they're probably more likely to get calls that would generate leads and be useful in this kind of a database than many of us are. So if we can get some kind of you know, I guess formal adoption by the village saying, this is what we'll do. And uh, this is going to be in our policy manual. And this is going to be going forward what uh, Sherry and everybody else over the village knows that they ought to do if they get uh, an inquiry about going into the village. And then Mike's question, you know, who's going to be the administrator is, is really a key question. Um, my guess is that the the professional village administrators would rather have somebody that they're paying be the professional administrator. But I don't know that we've asked that question yet. This has kind of come up since the last meeting and uh, Jennifer was not there at the last meeting. The last meeting was ridiculous long, a village trustees meeting that is. Uh, so I, to, uh, my input on that is I think it belongs with someone working for the village, right? It's a village asset, even though it's free. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, I don't want to presume that someone's got bandwidth, even though it, it's not going to take much time, at least at the beginning, right? It's, it's going to be, you know, uh, five minutes a week will be a lot. So, mm -hmm. I mean, if we get one lead a, lead a week, we're doing well. So I don't think it's a, a big, huge time ask. And I do think it belongs with someone, uh, like you said, Roger, who's an employee of the village versus someone who's on a volunteer commission. All right, uh, Jennifer's not here this morning. Uh, Rita, have you checked in? I can't see. Change the view around. To... No, I don't see Rita yet. So I, we have to wait till we get a trustee who's going to present it and uh, we can put together the package and give it to Jennifer and Rita and uh, get it in the board packet sooner than, you know, this morning for tonight's meeting uh, and get it into the next meeting and say, this is what we're suggesting that you do, blah, blah, blah. 
and hopefully get them to, I can't imagine that they wouldn't say, sure, let's do that. Uh, the only possibility is that they might get lost and well, we want to make our own look at what the CRM software situation is, but moving well, Roger, maybe, maybe be more, more succinct. What we can do is request that someone from, you know, one of the village employees be the administrator. And I'm happy to be the liaison with that person and report back to this group on a quarterly basis, unless something becomes really hot. All right, Pam, I hope you got that. I hope you have that down in the minutes because that's exactly what I'd like to send around to uh, to Bill Jacobs and the other trustees as a starting point, kind of, you know, assuming. Yeah, yes, I, I think that's a great suggestion. Yeah. Okay. So uh, some more to do on that, but some good progress in terms of where we're going. I really like that uh, list of questions thing that really uh, made it all concrete to me. Anybody else? Anything? Yeah, thank on? you. Thank you, Erwin, for putting that list together. That was 100% him. So thank you for that. It was uh, it was a good list. You're welcome. You're welcome. Okay. The next item on the agenda is the TIF information. And uh, I got an email yesterday and forwarded it to, to Mina and to Mike, which was a memo from uh, Trustee Kitzmeyer about the content of the flyer. Uh, any reactions, thoughts? Uh, I, I have my initial reaction and I just wanna be clear, I had nothing to do with the flyer. That was 100% Mina. And thank you, Mina, for putting that together. I, maybe I misunderstood, but on the call when we discussed the flyer, what, what I heard was that it had to be very basic and it couldn't be any type of a uh, solicitation um, to come in and be part of the TIF. I, and, and I could have completely misunderstood that. So I was a little bit surprised when I saw the comment um, that there was no call to action in the flyer because it, that to me, that's Mina followed the instruction that we were given. Mina, I don't know if you, if you wanna chime in, but I, I was a little bit surprised, right? The marketer and, and business development guy in me is always looking for call to action, but you know, the message I heard initially was that we have to be very careful when we're putting out something so that it wouldn't be considered quote, advertising the tip. And perhaps I misunderstood. Um, so I actually haven't been able to access any of my longer of emails. I got a new phone. So, um, and my computer somehow won't, won't let me access it either. So what did the email even say? But from based on Michael's um, comments, it seems like they, they want more, but I uh, completely agree with what Michael was saying. I'm assuming it's something to the effect of we need more, um, but, um, but I think our direction was given the prior history of the trust, the board's um, reaction to anything, that we were trying to keep it more benign and just advertising that we had TIFs and now that we had two TIFs, not just one. And so that we were just kind of outlining, these are all the possibilities of, of opportunities within a TIF without committing the board to any specific um, monetary or otherwise incentive related to a TIF. So I'm not sure, I mean, is that, I'm assuming based on what Michael's comments were, that's kind of what the, so I, yeah, until I can get access to my emails again, I've not been able to get on. Is that a regulatory issue? I mean, what's the basis behind that? I mean, is that so, so no one can come back and say that that's committed? So, you know what? I think when we first heard about doing like, you know, just trying to advertise our tips in general so that maybe we can get developers interested because a lot of them will look for tips. Um, they will look for tipped, tipped areas, especially if it's a greenfield site and needs a lot of infrastructure work because infrastructure work related to a greenfield site is very expensive for a developer. And if there's a TIF assistance or ability, you know, it sometimes moves it up the, the, the food chain, I wanna say. I mean, it, it won't guarantee that you're gonna get um, development in that location, but sometimes if they think that there might be some additional assistance provided by the local government through a TIF, then sometimes it's, it's more desirable than let's say if they've got two exact, two exact plots of land that they can equally build on and they're all perfect, then that's when the TIF would be considered an incentive and really you know, eke it over the edge. Um, so we've been always told that 
the board was very <laughs> anti wanting to commit to anything um, until, you know, project by project, which I completely agree with because we don't, but that's why we just listed out all of the possibilities. And I didn't even list all of them. It was just what I, I handpicked the ones that I thought were sort of okay. <laughs> but again, those are straight out of the statute. It's not like we're making those up or saying that we're committing to those. It's just ideas. And then that's why I reference, I copy at the bottom that, um, you know, these are just possibilities and they're directly derived from the statute. And so the comment that came back from the board was there's no call to action in the flyer. And, and maybe that's as simple <laughs> as they want to see, a, hey, call this person if you're interested, right? Cool. Um, then that's so fine. <laughs> I, the, then we can add that, right? Um, sure. It's just it, based on the based on the parameters that you were giving me, and I thought it was perfect. So, uh, you know, I yeah. could be reading too much into it too. If, if the call to action is, hey, if you're interested, call, you know, put put a name down, right? If it's the right. village manager, or the planner, or whoever, uh, that, so, that it could be as simple as that. And we can just leave a generic. You know, we can email, we can leave a, the generic phone number and um, the generic village manager email address until we get up, uh, right? And yeah, I think that's a good idea. Um, yeah, I mean, sure. Was that the only item? <laughs> Again, until I can access this, I don't know what I need to fix. That's, that's what it boiled down to. And it was, I, I was very surprised when I saw it because my first discussion was with Bill Jacobs when he saw it and he goes, well, Oh, you can't, he was very nervous and it wasn't regulatory. It was simply worrying about over-promising and somehow right. getting the village bound legally to do things that were in this flyer, uh, you know, kind of a, we're making an offer and if they accept, we're stuck with it kind of oh. rational. And there's, yeah, exactly. You know, you I know. thought it was more, and again, and maybe it's because I created it, but the intent was like more educational, like, hey, these are possibilities of what, what's something right. that can be yeah, done. Yeah, absolutely. Can. Right. I think um, it's. I think the way you have it is the way it's been been uh, presented is 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 good. You know, because we, you're right. We try to find line between the idea of a, of an offer, you know, right. which isn't where we want to be, and well, this is what the possibilities are pursuant to the, you know, the statute, the regulations, and you know, a phone number would be great. You know, just. Um, not necessarily a call to action, but you know, somebody to talk to if you've got ideas. Yeah, I mean, and we can, but again, is that right now during COVID, I think an email is better because phones are unanswered. Right, well, that's good, yeah. So I think if we do an email and a phone, because me personally, like I hate leaving voicemails because I hate listening to them. Um, so I'd much rather email at that point or text <laughs> than, than leave a voicemail that someone has to listen to, you know, for, Three minutes. <laughs> yeah, I think that's a good idea. It's easier to respond to one. So, did, did they want me to remove any specific items, or again, it was a laundry list directly from the statute because I thought that was the most benign way to do it. I think it's. We, want to get, we may want to get Brian Buckingham's uh, uh, information, uh, concepts, and what, what you, you should put on a sign. You know, sometimes you see in some of these villages, they put across the bottom of the banner of the sign. TIF district eligibility or right. something like that. That's a great idea. Now, yeah, that's a great idea, Jay. Although the question is, are the people who are going to develop something like that looking at science? But you know, <laughs> but maybe we could ask him about how, how they handle it. Maybe the better place to put it on the listing. Uh, right on the on the co-star listing and, and just yeah. kind of put in like you know, special, like it's got special incentive like TIF. But again. Yeah until we have incentives in place, which we won't, because um, it'll be case by case, if at all. I mean, then I think that's something that, um, but I mean, again, I'm at the, right? We're serving it a couple of like One thing you have going afraid. is that any of the pieces in that general area have a very low tax basis. Yeah. So that the incremental difference- uh, Will be huge. Probably every, single, every single piece, the incremental difference would be huge, yeah. obviously based upon interest and development. But and right now there's um, currently a zoned um, ag, isn't it? Because of the farmland right there, right? I, I'm, I'm assuming, you know, I haven't looked at the, not zoned, I'm sorry, it's being taxed at the agriculture, like the farmland, right, if I'm not mistaken. So in which case you're right, everything, everything will be an upside. Everything will be a huge increment if we can just get someone to develop. 
So, but anyway, I will make whatever changes as soon as I can access my and read what the directions are. So I think at a minimum, I will add a phone number and an email. Yeah. Generic right. email to the village manager. And then, um, yeah, and then we'll see. We can resubmit. Okay. <laughs> Thus my radio silence, Roger. I never saw the email. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's, uh, I, it, it just came yesterday. I, yeah, let's let's see exactly what they want because that's one trustee, and I don't know if that's a consensus kind of view toward what we should be doing or not doing. I, although I don't see the harm in getting a little bit more aggressive in terms of saying, "Hey, look at us," and uh, calling to, calling to action is. Uh, but that's what we're supposed to be doing. We're trying to promote economic development in our community, yeah. and I think yeah. by advertising that we have two amazing tips, whether or not they're so amazing for the client, but or the but. They're, they're there. I mean, we have some and it's tips are, you know, in an affluent area such as ours, tips are kind of unheard of normally. So I would think that that would be, it would spur something. Again, part of what our efforts, the original intent was to spur development. So. And to the best of everyone's knowledge, those don't have any significant environmental problems. So right. It's not... not that we know. <laughs> and not that anyone's done a phase one or, <laughs> but. Who knows? Anyway, okay. All right, very good. Um, the next item down is um, is drone editing. We were going to talk about uh, finding people and how that went. And uh, the people who are working on it are not here this morning. So I, I know that uh, some clips have been cut out and the clips have been posted various places of the, the drones that are there so far. And the, uh, the long version of the flyovers for the two TIFF areas is in the, the Google Drive, if anybody's interested, but nobody's done anything to try and uh, cut it or caption it or anything like that. So I, I, we shouldn't lose track on it, but unless somebody has some thoughts, I don't know that's much we can do this morning about it. Good morning, Trustee O'Connor. Good morning. We're just, uh, let's backtrack a little bit. And uh, we were talking about the, uh, the TIFF flyer that's been developed. Yes. And I can't remember whether you were copied on the, the email I got from Ann Kitzmeyer about the content of the TIFF flyer. No, I didn't see that. Okay, well, we had an interesting discussion because essentially the TIFF the email from Rita, from Ann, I keep straight here, uh, <laughs> suggested that we could be a little bit more aggressive in terms of the marketing flyer. And uh, we were all like, well, wait a minute. Uh, I thought you wanted to be very, very, low key and not aggressive and uh and uh, that was why we framed it so we were kind of scratching our heads about what what should we do uh you know to the extent that uh, it ought to be taken up with uh, the trustees what is it that exactly that they wanted that's kind of our question at this point well um that's a very good question um <laughs> and Anne's background is as you know marketing so um, I can understand that she would say that. I, I think a, um, when at the meeting tonight, we should just have Vic look it over real quick and see, it does very distinctly say may at the top, you know, it, it may include some of the following. Um, and I don't see anything wrong with that, but you, are, you're saying that Anne thought it should be more aggressive than what it is? Um, I just saw, uh, yeah, I just, I, I just pulled up the email and something, she said, add something along the lines of longer of us highly interested in retail and commercial developments in these districts and welcomes any ideas for discussion. Um, and then she said projects in tip district could include, you know, and then ellipses, and then please contact the link for further discussion. I actually, I think her ideas are great. I just wasn't sure that that's something that the board really wanted. If the board wants it, I'm all for it. I, I will totally make that change. 
Um, actually, what what maybe would be uh, not a bad idea would be to have both of them, the one that you developed and one that that um, Anne, Anne is chiming in on. Okay, yeah, totally. That's but easy. It could be at the meeting. The only um, only only uh, comment uh, uh, I, th I I like the the um, graphics on it. And you had to forgive me. Pardon me, I overslept, so I'm a little. <laughs> um, okay. uh, I had a very late night. Um, the the sentence that ends with compete. Okay. Um, Hold on. I'm pulling it up. Um, it was on the left hand side. Yep. Hold on one second. I can't send the one. Anyway. Okay. All right. It, it um, mm -hmm. I when I read it, um, it seemed like there should be a word or two after it. You know, I was kind of like compete, oh. <laughs> compete with what or compete for what. Okay, and what can we? I mean, I mean, we're saying to comp because right now these areas have been under obviously these are the areas that we're trying to um, make more marketable. So we're trying to have it compete against other um, greenfield sites across the similar area by us, not necessarily in Long Grove, but let's say maybe in Buffalo Grove or Arlington Heights or Palatine or wherever that they may. So to compete to actually, uh, uh, you're right, it, you're right. It's, um, I know what I wanted to say, but I mean, no, I mean, but to compete to, to get more visits, I think, but like, or more interest, but I don't know, how do you say that without making it sound like, oh, we're, we're a Charlie Brown tree and we really want you to like us. <laughs> I mean, um, if we could get some assurance from the village attorney, because Bill Jacobs, when I talked to him, was worried that somehow the village would be bound to do things uh, by things that were said in the flyer. I don't see that as a matter of creating a, a binding legal obligation and just a flyer like this. But if that's the concern that the trustees have, my sense was that everybody here was quite comfortable with getting it more aggressive than it was already. Uh, doing some at least softball promising, you know, this is, this is why this is a great place to come. Is, would... I understand, I, I understand what you're saying. Um, we shouldn't put anything in there that we're not able or willing to do. So it, it, it very distinctly says may. Um, and remember, you're, you're dealing with people who may have no knowledge at all of TIFs and what they're for and how they're structured and what they could do. Part of me says you really don't want to be, you don't want to be giving stuff away that you don't have to give away. Um, but I, I, yeah, you know, my undergrad was, I may have majored in English. So I, I distinctly see and saw the May in there. Um, I love the graphics. I like the color. I like the idea. Um, and, 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 I, you know, and I'm now I'm trying to project into 12 hours from now when the other trustees are reading it and, you know, goodness only knows what, what their input would be. Um, I, I say, you know, let's, let's do it, put it, put it there. And we can always strike it out. Cause this is directly exactly. from the statute. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. So, and we could always strike it out, but at least well, they know if they're not comfortable. So right. what are, what are we suggesting, Reed? Are we saying that we should have two alternative versions? One, why not? Maybe just with the contact, you know, phone number or email and the other, you oh, know, with the original language well, that Anne was suggesting? And, no, no, and no, no, no. I, I, I don't think it has to be, a, I think all, all it requires, Pam, and I think just from, um, I think we keep the flyer as is, and then I'll add a whole, I'll make a second or duplicate, and then I'll do one with a, the additional comments if you're interested, like we're looking for these commercial and retail activities, and if you're interested, contact such and such. I'll just add that in at the bottom. That way they can see like, oh yeah, okay. And then if they don't like any of the eligible TIF costs, what, what it may include, we can strike those out, whatever ones that they're, I mean, I, I'm assuming that they are. Well, it, I'm sorry, go ahead. 
No, no, no. But I'm just assuming that if there's anything that they weren't, um, if there's too much of a laundry list, and again, I included those just for kind of a explanatory or, or more, you know, illustrative kind of like just to show what is available or what options um, based on the statute, what is allowed, whether sure. or not we actually do it is a whole nother, which is why at the bottom, I it kind of, you know, caveat that actual eligible expenses will vary on a project basis. I mean, I was, the attorney in me was like, okay, I'm caveating the hell out of all of this. And <laughs> and what I came up with, because I'm quoting the statute almost verbatim, other, you know, the laundry list. And then I quote the actual statute, I mean, the actual statute at the bottom. And then I caveat it that they will vary. Sure. I personally right. thought from a legal perspective that we were covering our bases, that we weren't committing and that we weren't, it wouldn't be an offer, period. Right. <laughs> yeah. You yes. know, without any legal background, for, none of this land is owned by the village, or in some municipalities, the land is already in the hands of the village. Mm -hmm. So the gatekeepers, that one would have to acquire the land anyway. Um, the village really has no control over land, they have control over the district. So subject to uh, not having any legal background, um, the, the gate, it still requires the acquisition of the land off table from the village involvement, I would suspect. It's all mm -hmm. private sector land. Does the village own any, any of their land? No, correct? Am I, I correct think on that assumption? There's one pin in there, Jay, that we uncovered four years ago, three years okay. ago. <laughs> one pin, one little pin in there. But, um, but was, it, was, was that in order to create a spike strip or something else? I mean, or no, no, or no. It, it was it, it, um, I, it was something I had questioned. Uh, when we were back with uh, the archdiocese and and the housing community that was was okay. going, um, there was just one little pin in there that when I was researching something something popped up I forget what it is but during the discussion it was like oh my goodness what a look at this you know no big so deal that's, it, that's really actually in, that, that's actually in the hands of uh, the village or an entity controlled by the village I th I think by default if if my memory serves me. It was just just one little. It's a very very tiny little thing in there, but it had its own. Around by that Dorothy Drive or something. Yes, yes, area. yeah, precisely, precisely. But but you know that's that's minutiae really um, based upon the flyer, uh, and uh, we're not. And when you think about it, it really does depend upon who is suggesting what as to how creative we can get and how we can find funds, make funds available, what kind of terms we could be creative with but, or about. So. But Rita, isn't, I mean, again, the whole point of the increment, and I know we're running into the 730 time slot, um, mm -hmm. but, but the whole point of the increment is, I mean, for the TIP projects that I've done for my clients, you know, we get the TIP agreement in place. And once the increment is, added into the coffers that's when we like help that's when the community then assists with the paying back of like additional infrastructure costs or anything like that so we don't actually have to have the money now but it's more of a promise of future right so right and Correct. jay and i were talking earlier too that because right now the tax base there is so low the property mm -hmm. tax collected on those tips Yes, anything would be a huge increment compared to because it would be developed now versus just green and grass or farmland. Right, correct. In my personal opinion, but yeah. I mean, if you can find the time to tweak it and give us another version, uh, and, and if you can get it to me and to um, to Denise, we'll see that it gets into the packet tonight or, or to, to the it, trustees yeah. I'll directly. I'll try to do it right now as we're talking. <laughs> what? Yeah, and it, it it could save a couple of weeks time, you know. Yeah, so um, I'll watch for it and uh, we'll see if we can't get it so that the trustees can have something to actually look at tonight because if they have these two versions and Vince is there to go okay or not okay, I think we can just wrap this up. I don't think there's really that much difference in what we're all saying uh, in terms of what we want to do. But yeah, it is a little past 7.30 and uh, I've got a 312 number that I suspect is Matt sitting out there waiting for us. Matt, is that you? Am 
Am I frozen up? No. No, I can hear you. No, you're not frozen. Okay. Pam, the you want to introduce? Might be, might be Michael Elliott, maybe. Matt, no, are you there? Okay. Maybe he's not on. I'm the 630 number. Got it. <laughs> there you go, Michael. Yeah, there is a 312 number, and it's on mute right now. Well, it's a Amy's on a three one two number, so uh, unless there's two, nope, there's only the one. Oh, that's just me. <laughs> okay. Um, then let's let's move the agenda because we've got uh, Brian coming at eight. And some of the things on the agenda we've actually copied uh, or we've actually covered already. Um, the next item, item six, the uh, script for development inquiries we've got covered, unless anybody has any more thoughts. Uh, that was uh, very well done, to say the least. Any other thoughts on that at this point? No, I just had one more quick thought on the TIF flyer. And if I apologize, I don't have it in front of me, but I did notice the, the Long Grove logo on that. And I, I'm not sure if that was uh, left off purposely uh, because it's a TIF flyer, but if, if it's okay to have it on there, I think it needs to be on brand. Where would you put it? I, see, I'm not even a marketing person. I'm not artistic whatsoever. I kind of cobbled this together off of my Word document. <laughs> yeah, no, I just, I would have it, yeah, you have to fit it in there, right? So it, it looks good aesthetically, but um, I would just put it near near the top, either centered or off to the right. Um, but um, our logo has a white background, so it, it might not. It, I don't know if it'll yeah, show. Yeah, we have up. to make it. Yeah. Um, yeah, let me see if I could butts around with that. I'm not sure if I've got the capability to do something like that. Huh. <laughs> and that could always be that could always be added later, right? I just I just thought it yeah. was uh, it would be better to have it on there than not. And just my opinion. No, that's a good idea. Okay. Um, next item number seven: distribution of information on distribution of information to new residents or to businesses. Uh, my memory is that it really didn't get touched at the last village trustee meeting uh, because the, there were a lot of things on their plate at the meeting. So it's kind of put aside, but and hopefully Rita's got some memory here too. The sense was that everybody's pretty much on board saying that doing this is a good idea uh, there have been a couple of emails circulated this week with ideas for places where the um, addresses for new residents could be acquired, but we're still on the practical question of, all right, who's going to do it? Uh, I didn't get the sense that the village board wanted or expected a, a group of volunteers to take on the job of finding every new resident and sending them a packet. Is that? That's correct. I, so, I, think, I think that if, if we can use waste management's list as a source, that to me, that's something that there's a, a, a letter, it's pre-signed and it gets, it gets mailed out, boom, boom, boom. We get the list once a month, every two weeks, whatever. And it just gets sent out from Village Hall. Would it be helpful for us as a group to develop a, uh, a draft kind of thing uh, as a starting point? Or um, a contest or something like that? Or should we just back off now and well, it what it you we you don't have the benefit of it having been discussed at the last meeting, and I think I think we finished up at like eleven thirty that night. <laughs> you know, yeah. Uh, so, I, I my suggestion would be to let's submit whatever 
whatever the thoughts and or items are and put it on the table and see what the consensus is. That it's gonna be so much better than just continuing to kick this can, you know? So does that help? So, all right, so that boils down to um, what we feel. Do we want to, do we want to try and develop something? Should we subcontract this out to a couple of members? Should we all try and just contribute to one document and throw our thoughts in there? I, you know, we could create a Google doc that we could share. Would that be violating the Open Meetings Act? I'm full of questions this morning. Uh, <laughs> thoughts? I'd be happy to work on something like that. You know, I, you know, I think I had circulated um, to you, Rita and, and Roger, something that, you know, as an alternative, but, you know, we don't have to, it's not something we have to do, but Highland Park's uh, website had a, a new resident page on it. And, you know, they had some helpful links and information, you know, that was geared towards um, some things that would be useful to new residents. And, you know, they had some Lake County links and um, links to the, you know, in our case, we could put the downtown merchants association link and some other things that might be useful to new residents. I mean, that's another thing we could think about or, you know, put together this letter where we referenced the same type of thing, you know, some useful links for for new residents. And I was thinking that having some content that talked about the fact that Long Grove doesn't collect any real property taxes and that Long Grove is, at least in my mind, a, a, a do-it-yourself village government, very, very volunteer with very, very few in place, would be something worth sending to people early on, whether they read or not is another question, but uh, this started with us talking about people saying, oh, I hate the Long Grove Village taxes and then being amazed to find out Long Grove doesn't take any ta property taxes. Uh, you know, simple things that are unique. Uh, the stuff that is like Lake County numbers or fire department and all that kind of business, um, that's all over the place and, and not, I don't know. I think it'd be worthwhile to have uh, an aggregation of possible content items. I'll put mine down and share that with you, Pam. And if you've got some more ideas, and if anybody else has any ideas about content, uh, pass yeah, them along. We, yeah, we can work on that and you know, just kind of include some basic information that you residents would want to know, some good phone numbers, contact information. Um, you know, reference to Lake County, you know, things that we can we can include there that might be helpful. Let me, let me just add to this. I, I really think, I like what Pam said, uh, what I think Highland Park is doing. I think we should have a new residence uh, um, page on our website. We should send a letter referencing that because people are going to lose that letter. I think we'd like to get them used yeah. to going to the website and hope, and, and Mike Elliott mentioned, uh, a couple of meetings ago about social media. Hopefully we could tie that in down the road, but let, let, let's use the website. We're investing a lot of money in the website. Let's push them there. People aren't gonna forget what they did with the letter. And that can have all these things we want on there. Did anybody right, else get we... invitations to next door, the social media thing next door? Did you put it in my car? Did you put it in my car? Okay, I'm checking the fridge. No. No. Uh, um, apparent, apparently, some of the folks in the northern end of Long Grove um, are next door doesn't know it's Long Grove. Uh, Bill, Bill Jacobs community. Um, uh -huh. <clears throat> they're put. They've put him into Mundelein. So, so we're trying to get a hold of uh, <laughs> the powers that be at next door to remind them that that's Long Grove. And next next door just redrew a lot of geographic boundaries apparently, and they all all of a sudden I'm getting I'm getting news from Arlington Heights. So, well, is is the village's social media manager uh, now actively 
working with next door that's what i thought was going to happen based upon what the village board voted on uh, yes that's correct which is why i assume that uh, i got uh, a, an invitation to next door since it was now an official media outlet for the village but if, if nobody else is getting it uh, yeah that may or may not be because again you're not you don't live that far from me and and i i know that they just fiddled with they they uh, have incorporated parts of other communities into what had been just like Southern Long Grove. So. Okay. Does the village get any information about uh, recorded title transfers? Uh, oh, no. Of home. No. So, so that, that's, that they do not get, no one knows how many new people have moved into Long Grove or uh, and moved out or anything else like that. Right. And there are, um, they do print that in the, the Herald and they print it in the Trib like on Thursdays, I believe it is. And, and that's, those, those uh, notices are not necessarily 100% of what has actually taken place. That's, that's why the garbage company, waste management would be a much better resource. And waste management shares their data or will share that data? Um, apparently they will, but it has to go through, you, you know, channels. You know, you, you can't call and get it, and I can't call and get it, but Village Hall can. Okay. You know, and, and I agree I agree with Erwin and Pam. I, I think the new resident link on the website is page is a, a great idea. Just a, a nice, short, sweet letter. Welcome to the village. You know, um, we, you know, we're thrilled to have you. The village has been, you know, blah, 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 so many residents. Lots of opportunities, you know, by the way, here's the link to to the, you know, new resident page on the website that you'll find helpful and interesting. You know, Bill Jacob, period, done. Lita, do you, do you feel that there's a lot of residential transactions more so than the average that have occurred in the last six months? In oh, world? yes, everywhere, everywhere, not just us. Right, but how about Long Road specific? I mean, do you think it's a, do you think it's an order of magnitude different than uh, the trailing several years? It's unusual for a house not to be sold within a couple of weeks in Long Grove. The J in my in my development, there's usually twelve to fifteen houses at any time out of one hundred and twenty five that are available. We're down to I think three, including empty lots that have sold. Okay. So there's I believe there's been more activity this. Year last 12 months than in a long time, long time. I have a friend who has a house on a dead end on the east side of Route 83. It was on the market for a year and a half. It wouldn't come anywhere near the ask. She relisted seven offers within a week. So yeah, it's, it's a good time to sell your house, I guess. So what's our next step on this matter? What have we decided how we get up? go forward on this. I think where we left it was we're going to create some kind of document. Pam's going to be kind of the collector uh, and then give this document to the village board saying, can we put this out or else tell us what else you want to put in or take out and more or less nudge the, the board toward getting this done. Is that so, so Roger, would it be a letter saying go to the website and, and Pam will come up with the list of what should be on the new resident website? Is that our path, do we think? Maybe, I don't know. Maybe it's both. You know, uh, okay. part of the problem with all of this is somebody's got to do that first draft. That's, in my mind, the hardest part of okay. any project. So if we can get the first draft done and then... Well, Roger, why don't, we, why don't we work on the first draft together on... Okay. You know, we can we could put together a letter that you know references um, that has some content to it too, and then uh, hopefully also do a new resident page if that's what the board wants to do. Yeah, I really don't know. Can we safely share that with trustees as well at the same time, just to get their input, their individual input? Sure. Why not? Okay, so so we can get a rough work through. We can send it on to Bobby and to Bill and say, "What do you think?" Please give us your ideas. Uh, 
Bill's pro Bill will probably send it to Melanie. That would be mm. my guess. Um, and, That's a good point. You know, yeah. so. Melanie being? Uh, she's, she's the one who helps with the newsletter, gets it out. P she's the PR person. That's what I thought, but I just wanted to make sure. Yeah, social media and all that. I mean, I, I think it just needs to be a, you know, a welcome, a welcome neighbor kind of letter referencing the, the website. All right. Um, the last thing we have on the agenda is to talk about uh, the EDC microsite and development and we've got 10 minutes until Brian appears, Everything. hopefully. Any thoughts on how we're doing with the micro websites? I know uh, Denise recirculated the list of sites that are done by our site developer, the Village's site developer. Yeah, um, um, Unicode, right. Mm -hmm. We circulated that. I don't know, am, am I correct about that? Um, I don't know, we could, we could double back and see. I thought there was one um, more local Illinois website that they had worked on, which was Woodstock. I don't know if I'm correct about that. But you know we can we can uh, go back and see if that's the case, and I'll take a look at that as on as well as a number of other websites that Municode has worked on, you know, where they've prepared these microsites for the EDCs, and you know we could talk about that at our next meeting, Roger, and see you know what you know, how people might want to possibly rank those sites. My sense is that in substance, the sites are all pretty much the same. Uh, you know, they use different colors, they use different pictures, but the thing that I thought was the most compelling was to have a, I would call it a landing page. I'm just, probably there's some IT type word to use for this, but some place that you land on that's simple, doesn't have very much in terms of content, but just has a lot of, I call them tabs, or, or buttons to click that will tell you, take you to the, the various places that you want to deal with, you know, um, zoning or um, past developments or demographics, all those kind of things, all, all on one page where you land to it and uh, it wraps everything up all at once and that's the starting point and then leads on to other things. I think we talked about that at the last meeting. That's a good suggestion, Roger. Maybe we, should look at these various sites and come up with the tabs, you know, like the available sites, you know, opportunities for development, um, successful past developments, demographics, zoning, you know, th the, maybe the five or six uh, key tabs that we think we're gonna need in our EDC microsite that, you know, are part of these other uh, websites that, that Municode has worked on. And, you know, then we can go from there. Maybe, you know, that, that can be the gateway for them to help us develop our own microsite. Every time I've looked at the EDC website, I've found something new where something that we've talked about has been incorporated in the site. Uh, so it's all, in my mind, going into the bin so it's there, uh, like the, the videos and like the interviews and all these other kinds of things. And the thing that could use some refining is the, the organization, the, the outlining, the, the, the navigation tools that make it uh, a little bit easier to use. That's the one thing that I see in all the Municode sites that they're good about, which is helping you navigate, helping you get to the to the right place with not too many clicks. Any other thoughts on 
this kind of business? Denise should really be a part of this conversation. At least for now, she's uh, driving the bus, so to speak, in terms of the EDC website. Well, maybe we could table this for um, the next meeting. And again, I think I like your idea of, you know, honing in on organization for Municode to help us with that, you know, tabs that can more easily navigate um, folks into these key areas, like available sites for development, demographics, zoning, all, all of those things. I think that's the key to what we have to do in terms of making it more user friendly? I could take that as a motion to table and ask for a second, but I think we're all, we're all in agreement without going through the formalities of uh, Robert's rules or whatever. Uh, let's move on to the, uh, to the next, if we can. I, I saw another sign in here. Uh, Brian, could that be you at the, the bottom of my screen? Is Matt there, Matt Quinn? I've got Amy, I've got Mike, I've got. If you're wondering about this phone number, 5050, that's Bobby O'Reilly. Good morning, yeah, thank you. Good morning. Oh, hi, Bob, Bobby. Okay, so essentially we're waiting on Brian. <laughs> or we're taking the kids to school. There we go, Brian Buckingham. So give, give Brian a minute or two to get himself connected in and then we can uh, listen to what's going on in the, in the area at least his perceptions of it. I think this is a great idea to have these kinds of speakers come in and uh, educate us. Brian, are you um, able, or, or are you, sorry, I have to be in the car, Brian, otherwise I was gonna introduce you. Can you hear us yet? It says he's connecting to audio. Still, okay. So he's, he's working on it. And I think Brian has connected. Is that, can you hear us, Brian? I just got connected. There we go. Hi, everybody. Good morning. Hi, Brian. Marina. Who's this hey, guy? Hi, Brian. Hi. So, hi, Brian. I would. I was just on the video, but I have to take my kids to school for testing. <laughs> but um, oh. I wanted to thank you so much for um, joining us today and, um, and talking to our EDC group. We've got a couple of board members, trustees uh, also on the call. Um, sure. But yeah, we are so excited and thank you so much again for joining us. And we just kind of, we just kind of want to hear kind of what's going on. You know, um, we see your name plastered all over the place um, in our community and we love it. And we, we know that you're very active and actively trying to, you know, um, work with some of the properties that are available. So, you know, mm -hmm. tell us what's going on. And, you know, we kind of want this just to be an open dialogue of, um, things that you're seeing, things that you want, maybe how how um, communities such as ourselves can help, you know, real estate brokers, you know, commercial real estate brokers like you, how we can help you market some of your sites. Like the, I know you have two specifically in Long Grove, maybe more. Um, I know I've also seen you in like Hawthorne Woods and everywhere else too, but let us know what you're seeing, some of the trends. Um, and yeah, let's just talk and um, thank you again. I'm gonna put myself on mute. <laughs> Great. No, thanks for the introduction. Um, hi, everybody. Good morning. Um, so just a brief background on, on who I am um, and, and what I do at CB. So um, I work on the land services team at CBRE. I've been there for 20 years uh, and I work with a group of four other gentlemen who all we do is sell land parcels or redevelopment parcels. So anything where there's value in the land is what we work on. So whether it be a, a, a green field further out for a master plan residential community, or maybe it's a mom and pop retail strip center that 
is no longer the highest and best use that uh, needs to be redeveloped for you name it, uh, industrial, office, or or residential. So, so that's that's pretty much what we do. I live in Libertyville, so it just so happens that my geography is is that Lake Southern Lake County and Northern Market. I have a couple other partners who live one in Naperville and one out in Batavia, St. Charles. So it just kind of naturally fits that uh, Lake County is in my backyard. So I'm a little bit more active. Uh, in this market than I, I am uh, out west or or down south. So, you know, I figured I would just give you a general uh, flavor of where things are at, and, and some of this is you may already be aware of, but it's it's worth uh, running through. But, you know, generally speaking, in market trends, um, you know, the office market is is pretty much dead and has been for a very long time. There hasn't been a new um, speculative uh, office building built in probably over a dozen years. Um, so, so you know, the office market is is tough. My office uh, leasing guys are saying that it's starting to come back a little bit. You know, downtown there's probably there's more sublease space on the market than there ever has been. Um, you know, and I think a lot of employers are just starting to figure out, you know, the work life balance and getting through COVID. How does that impact things moving forward? So I think that's a question that's being figured out as we speak. You know, the retail sector from the land side is uh, is another very challenging um, sector. Uh, big box retail is, is not expanding. Everyone's shrinking their footprint. Uh, really, the Amazon effect has, has impacted that. You know, a lot of this, uh, everything is going direct to consumer now. So, you know, the large format retail is, is really a dinosaur. Um, the retail activity that we are seeing is really – you know, the, the restaurants who all want to drive through now. Um, so the new layouts for many of the, the fast casual restaurants is to have either pickup windows or drive throughs. Uh, so that's the theme on retail and really anything that's not at a main and main location is, is really tough to, to sell to any retail developers. Um, now the positive side of the market, two of the very hot sectors are industrial and residential. Uh, industrial is just on fire right now. Uh, kind of what I mentioned before, the Amazon effect is really just uh, taking, it's have a huge impact on the market. You, you may be familiar with the uh, the Darling Farm, which is on uh, in Vernon Hills on Milwaukee Avenue, uh, west of, or, uh, yeah, just west of Milwaukee. It's kind of adjacent to the whole Van Vlissingen uh, Industrial Park, uh, north of Half Day Road. That was a 66 acre parcel, really one of the last large pieces in the area. It sold the Panatoni a couple of months, maybe six months back for industrial, and that sold for $21 million, a 66 acre piece um, to do industrial warehousing and, and logistics. So, you know, that's $8 a square foot. That's a pretty darn good number. And that was speculative, you know, bought on spec, build it, and they will come. Not, you know, just five or six years ago, it was tough to get industrial developers to build on spec. They wouldn't do anything unless they had a user in tow. So that's, uh, so the industrial market is really on fire. Um, similarly, the, the residential market is very hot. You know, I think uh, the combination of COVID and the combination of millennials uh, starting to consider the suburbs uh, to make their home has been a real driver for the residential the for sale residential guys in particular are really pushing hard for new sites. Um, you know, in Illinois, we're not, you know, ever since the, the bubble bursted in 2008, we never really saw a big uh, pushback for the residential developers. Now we're starting to see that all of them are trying to fill their pipeline and, and get homes built because of the activity. I'm sure all of you are aware the resale market is just crazy. Um, so the, the new home builders are trying to take advantage of that as well uh, and get into to many new projects in good school districts and established communities as they possibly can. Um, uh, and two other sectors that fall under the residential developers umbrella would also be apartments and senior housing. So I think as all of you know, there's been a fair amount of saturation from the senior housing developers. Um, you know, and when I talk about senior housing, there's really a full scale. There's your independent living, assisted living, memory care, and then there's also just age targeted um, independent living. So all of those sectors are remain pretty hot. They were slowed down by COVID over the last year. 
Um, but uh, but those developers are still looking for properties. I would say the, the you know the acute care developers that market has really been saturated. You know the memory care and the assisted living. There's a lot of saturation there. Um, but I still think there's good opportunity for independent living or or restricted independent living. You know 55 and older active adult living. So that's a sector that still remains pretty hot. And then also apartments. You know the apartment market also has been a bit saturated in our area. If you look at, you know, Melody Farms, uh, that, that 440 Social in, in Lincolnshire, uh, I know Buffalo Grove uh, is trying to get a deal done at their town center and redevelop their old strip mall. <clears throat> um, and those examples are apartments with, with heights, you know, the wrap concept where you have the parking garage in the middle um, and their elevator buildings. You know, those were hot for the last, seven years and a couple of good projects got out of the ground. What we're starting to see now is a bit of a shift in that segment. That construction type is starting to prove out to be extremely expensive. You know, with the cost of lumber and the cost of concrete and the cost of labor. Um, so that multi-story concept is starting to be very difficult to pencil out uh, when you factor in construction costs, taxes, uh, fees, and all the others. So you're starting to see a shift from those guys to do more walk-up style rentals, you know, essentially a townhome that's, that's a, that's for rent. We're also starting to see one of the big buzzwords now is single family rentals. Now I haven't seen one of those actually get done in this market yet, but in other markets they're in the ground and they're very successful. So we're starting to see the apartment developers take a look at that segment of the market, you know, small single family homes that are for rent. Um, now you need a little more acreage to do that, um, maybe 15 plus acres, as opposed to a five acre piece where you can do a multi-story uh, apartment development. So those are, I figured I'd just give you the quick rundown of those different segments. Um, and I've done that. Um, I would say generally speaking, there's a lot of optimism for suburban development based on what we just, just went through with COVID and then some of the, you know, the civil unrest in the city and people start to realize, you know, maybe living in the city is not as uh, all it's cracked up to be. So we're really starting to see that push to the suburbs. And, um, you know, in our camp, we're at least, we're pretty uh, bullish and optimistic about the next couple of years. Um, right now it's industrial and residential, but hopefully as that grows, we're going to start to see other sectors be successful in the suburbs as well. You know, um, to that point, many of our developers are, are telling us, don't even bring me a site that's in Cook County. We won't even look at it. And the reason for that is the, the, the real estate taxes are skyrocketing. Uh, the difficulty of getting approvals is, is high. Fees are high. And then there's also, at least in, the, in Chicago, in the city, there's affordability, affordability restrictions now for residential. Any project you do, you have to build 20% affordable. Uh, and that's a uh, that's a huge economic burden to these developers. So for for all those various reasons, they're saying find me something outside of Cook County uh, where the path to success is a little easier. Um, so that that's really a theme right now. All these developers are saying, hey, look, we we want to build, we want to develop, we want to do it in places with good schools and established communities, but at the same time, we want to have a path. We want to see a path to success. We don't want to, you know fight and we don't want to uh, try to jam something down the throats of a municipality or have residents not want us in their community. They want to find something where they can be collaborative and be supportive and work towards a, a you know, a, um, a goal that, that the community and the developer are both aligned. So, um, so developers are passing on any properties that are, might be challenging when it comes to that and they're finding the path of least resistance. Um, because in their minds, the market's hot right now, and they want to take advantage of that. <clears throat> um, you know, I talked about this a little bit, but uh, some of the challenges that I see in the market are, uh, you know, and I, I talk with landowners all the time, and, you know, they're, they're excited about the optimism in the market, especially the residential. So, so land parcels I have that are geared for residential development, um, my landowner will say, hey, there's so much activity going on and the resale market's great as my value has increased, right? And well, unfortunately, the answer is no. But however, we might have more interest in the property now. Um, you know, it's unfortunate for landowners because we haven't seen a whole lot of appreciation 
<clears throat> but what we have seen is interest. Um, there's more people interested interested in contracting your property and try to get it developed. <clears throat> and the reason is just those construction costs have shot up. You know, lumber is crazy, as I'm sure you guys have heard and seen on the news and labor costs, and concrete, everything has gone up. Fees have gone up. Taxes have gone up. <clears throat> so we have a an audience who's interested in the property, but it doesn't necessarily translate to these, you know, super high values anymore. Um, so, and in, in, unfortunately in Illinois, it, you know, we, we one of the other <clears throat> issues that I'm dealing with, not necessarily on the residential for sale side, but on the apartments or senior housing or even industrial, you know, the equity markets are very tight right now. Um, they were very tight throughout the COVID uh, stretch and they remain tight in our market in Illinois. Um, you know, reason being is equity sources are from all over the country. And when a decision maker is sitting at their desk and they're comparing a senior housing or apartment development in suburban Chicago versus one that's taking place in Nashville or Austin, Texas, or one of these other markets that's on fire, it's very difficult to convince them to come here. So I'm working on three deals right now, um, two senior housing deals and one apartment deal. All of them have full entitlements uh, and building permits can be pulled uh, and ready to go, but they've not closed yet because um, equity sources have not been identified yet. So, so that's a, a, a pretty big challenge as well in today's market, in, in our market in particular. I think there's some optimism that'll loosen up in the fourth quarter as we move forward, but that's, that's been a challenge for the past 10 months. Um, you know, I talked about this earlier, but generally, you know, moving forward, I think that, um, you know, work-life balance is going to have an impact on real estate markets. Most office users are going to shrink their footprints. Um, and that's going to be, you know, a ripple effect to all other sectors in real estate. So, um, I also spoke about the, the industrial with the Amazon effect. I also think the experiential will come back. You know, I keep referring to Melody Farms where we have the restaurants and, you know, um, the apartments there and across the street, Hawthorne Mall is going to be doing 300 more apartments and they're trying to attract uh, more uh, entertainment and experiential users. I do think that's a path forward. Um, <clears throat> you know, the traditional retail is, is no longer, but, you know, you're hearing about these different concepts uh, like, a, like uh, you know, the Dave and, not new, but Dave and Buster's, but um, also like the ax throwing places and the, you know, the, the Mario Andretti race, uh, raceway is a use that might be landing in Schaumburg. So, you know, the, the movie theaters are hopefully coming back. So I think that really carries the day for retail. Um, and, and you're going to start seeing that. For example, you may have seen in Cranes, you know, the Northbrook uh, Mall, that's uh, they're, they're considering hiring a brokerage company and taking it out and selling that asset because they're so far underwater on their loan. And that could be a complete redevelopment of that, of that project. You know, they lost three of their big, big anchors. And now it's, so w what, what does that become? What does that want to be? It's, it's no longer a big, large indoor mall. It might be, you know, a mixed use, uh, high density residential with other experiential uses. So there's a lot of the market is moving so quickly and it's so fluid. Um, and that's what we have to adapt to. Um, so, um, so that, that's kind of it. I, I kind of ran through those, those things kind of quickly, but I'd be happy to open it up and just kind of talk about the market in general, if there's any questions. Um, again, all I do is deals where the, the land is, is the value. So for example, when I talk about that Northbrook mall piece, I mean, that's something that we track and are on top of because, um, you know, the existing structures and those retail tenants, that's no longer the highest and best use. Um, so that, that's, that's my spiel. I'm happy to, to chat further about anything. I have a question for you, Brian. Sure. This, this is Rita O'Connor. Um, Living in Libertyville, you are aware of Long Grove, and um, let's say we we would be described as niche to quirky. Mm -hmm. What what kind of of retail besides restaurants um, 
comes to mind when you think of, of Long Grove and revenues? Tax um, yeah, you know, I think that's, it's, it's, frankly, it's not just Long Grove, it's every municipality in, in the area right now. I mean, unless you have a location on Main and Main at a, at a, a lighted intersection, it's going to be extremely difficult to attract retail users. It, it just is. Um, you know, the, uh, you know I'm, I'm working on a number of deals where municipalities want sales tax revenue generators and uh, we're just coming up empty. Um, just because there's there's a lack of expansion for those types of uses, the hot uses right now are, you know, uh, like the the uh, the bone of beef, like the the competitor to Portillo's. I mean, those types of restaurants are doing wonderful and have done great during COVID. Um, so anything that's got a, like a drive-through type fast food restaurant is is doing very well. Um, those are the, the high users. You know, the other the other hot users, and I I don't 100% understand why it's so hot, but our gas stations. You know, gas stations have been actively pursuing sites in the market over the past year. You know, again, they need to be at a hard corner, lighted intersection with good access. And again, I don't understand it based on the electronic cars that are, you know, in the future. But I think at the end of the day, it's probably their C stores really make them a tremendous amount of money. And when you're at good lighted intersections, people are going to stop in and buy a candy bar or, you know, whatever it is. And that's where they make their margins. But, um, you know, any site on main and main at a lighted intersection, a gas user is going to be taking a hard look at. So, so it's really, it's, it's not the large format. It's really the smaller, you know, one acre, one to three acre users on pad sites where convenience is the driver. Um, you know, the large box format is just kind of a, a, a dying breed. There are very few looking to expand. And the ones who are looking to expand, it's got to be, you know, the story's got to be just wonderful. It, you know, the rooftops have to be there. The demographics have to be there. The hard corner lighted intersection needs to be there. Maybe there needs to be TIF from, from the municipality. I mean, everything needs to line up. The, the stars just need to line up perfectly for any sort of, um, you know, retail or mixed use developments. So I don't know if that's a long winded way of answering your question. Um, I apologize, but that's, that's what we're seeing. Oh, thanks very much. It's useful. Sure. On a specific uh, relationship to uh, the bacon piece in Long Grove now, are you representing, are you representing the 15 acres on 83? Or yes. Yep. Okay. I am correct. Yes. I'm the listing agent on that. Yes. What do you visualize that? Best, best use pattern for? You know, I think I think the highest and best Independent of residential zoning, yeah. but let's assume any, any type of zoning available. Is that, a, is that a apartment site? Is that a, is that a retail site? Is that a, not, what is that? What kind of site is that? You know, I think that site, um, you know, a couple of things. I think the, um, you know, from my Due diligence on a site and talk to the consultants. There's, there's just absolutely no way you're going to get a full access um, at that light at 83 and 53. That IDOT's never going to allow that. So that really kind of hamstrings any, um, any, any real retail uh, of size. Um, so I think, you know, based on the access, based on the location and the market, I think that 15 acres is ideal for some sort of residential development. I think it could be a um, a big win for the existing retailers where the sunset food is and also the downtown getting more rooftops with discretionary dollars to spend, I think is probably the highest and best use there. I don't envision necessarily a, you know, a, a multi-story apartment development, but what I would think is the highest and best use in today's market for that property is probably a, a walk up high end um, town home or single family home rental product where you have young professionals, um, probably dual incomes renting those units, or you have empty nesters who are selling their, you know, acre lots, large home. Uh, maybe they are uh, part-time residents of Illinois, but don't want to own real estate in Illinois anymore. And they have another place in Arizona or Florida and they rent. They also have a, a rental property in Long Grove where they have roots or where they, they, they have lived for many, many years. So that's a use that I think is the highest and best use. I think, you know, maybe there's a chance to carve out a small retail portion there and kind of build off the, 
what's to the south, but any any large scale retail or commercial at that location is just not feasible. I want to visualize for our, the new TIF district, which is off of um, Lake Cook Road and Old, Old 53. Are you, you're familiar with that area in general? Where Menage yes. is, et cetera. Well, sure. I mean, what, what would you see the big picture for next 10 years in that area? Because we're obviously proposing the TIF districts in place. What, what are the use patterns going to be there? Yeah, I think, you know, I'm familiar with that. And I think that that one gentleman, I can't remember his name, but almost would the TIF include that piece that's um, to the west of Menard? I think that's that owner has a large piece of property. I think about 100 acres, right? Correct. I, I, yeah. On the west side of the street. The yes, yeah. correct, correct. So that's, you know, that's a large enough piece where I think you could probably do, you know, in that location at, at Lake Cook where 53 dead ends, you know, again, retail and commercial is challenged, but that piece being large enough and having a TIF in place could attract those users that, that could generate sales tax revenue. I think that could be a property where you could see a multitude of uses. I think you, you definitely need to have a large, large amount of residential, but then that large amount of residential could also bring in um, entertainment uses, retail uses. You know, I think that could be a master plan mixed use development. I think that could be probably something similar to a Melody Farms in Vernon Hills at that location, just because, and the luxury you have there is you're just outside of Cook County. You're on the north side of Lake Cook. So you don't have to deal with Cook County taxes and the issues that come along with that. Um, I know there are some physical issues on that property, wetlands, floodplain, maybe some bad soils, <clears throat> but having a TIF in place could help alleviate some of those issues. Um, I think that's a prime piece of property. Uh, I know that the owner of that piece uh, has, you know, um, has high expectations um, and isn't necessarily a, a seller right now unless he gets a huge number. But, um, but I would say in general, that could be a property that could see a multitude of different uses and could be a large scale master development full of mixed uses. Um, Cause I would consider that to be almost a main and main location. What do you think is our biggest impediment as Long Grove or, or perception um, as a community for, to prevent us from getting uh, some of these larger opportunities or looks, do you think? I mean, I think we're trying to do the right thing. We're trying to do the, you know, tips and, and you know, we're trying to be more pro-economic development and pro-business. So what do you think is our largest impediment that you think we should overcome or try to overcome? Um, can I think one of the big one of the big things in any municipality is <clears throat> one that sometimes you know, a clear direction is what a developer wants most. Um, you know, a, a, a predictable outcome. Right? So, and that doesn't necessarily mean it needs to be a project that is 100% supported. But um, what developers have a hard time. Uh, getting their heads around or spending resources or trying to pursue deals <clears throat> is when they, you know, interact with staff or village members and they, they don't really have a, a clear answer for them. If they say, we don't, we don't necessarily like the plan that you propose, but we don't necessarily know what we want, you know, keep throwing darts at it. I mean, and that, that's a difficult position for a, a developer to be in. So my suggestion would always be to, you know, if a municipality can do it and, and get on the same page and get trustees on the same page and staff on the same page and have a clear direction as to what they want to see uh, on the vacant parcels they have in the municipality, that that's huge. I mean, a quick no to a developer is, is way better than a long, dragged out no. I mean, that that's difficult for them to spend any sort of time or effort on. Um, I do think that there's, there's some... Um, uh, I don't know if the development community fully understands what could be supported, at least on the piece that I'm working on. Um, and, and does it adhere to the market? Um, you know, so I think that um, I think some, some being open-minded to, to where the market is now um, and, you know, being optimistic and, 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 you know, being open-minded to, to seeing uses that appeal 
to today's market is, is really key. I mean, otherwise, um, properties are going to stay vacant for, for a long, long time. Um, but that's, you know, and frankly, the, uh, I'm happy to share it with you all. But the, the developer, we actually have the, that piece, that 53 and 83 property under contract. Um, and they had a concept plan for walk-up townhomes, like I described. Walk-up townhomes, luxury rentals, and then they were trying to do two retail buildings with first-floor retail and maybe some you know, high-end lofts above. Uh, and they just told me yesterday they ter- they're going to terminate the deal um, because their perception was that it would just be too big of a lift. Um, and they, they, they wouldn't be supported um, by the village. Now, right, wrong, or different, they talked to their consultants, the uh, zoning attorneys and some others, and they just felt like it, they were going to have a hard time justifying spending their time, money, and resources fighting an uphill battle. So they chose to, to walk away from the deal. And that, that was just happened yesterday, so I need to, to get some more information and find out some more details as to why they made the decision. And, and maybe get them back interested, but but um, but that in general, not just Long Grove or anywhere, those are the things. Um, you know, having a clear path to success, or, or at least um, a clear path to common sense, open-minded decision makers is really what developers are looking for. If there's any sort of confusion or uh, any sort of you know, mixed signals or not a clear path, then, then it's very difficult for developers to, to spend their time and efforts on properties. Well, that's kind of concerning uh, in regards to specifics when you get down the micro. So you say that site, you have some interest with a specific generalized plan and they're walking away from the deal is not suddenly some change in the marketplace, but change in the uh, perception of uh, hassles and or zoning. Is that, or am I misstating that? Is it related to the 5383 piece? I mean, yeah, I mean, the, the specific, go ahead. I mean, I just want to understand the, uh, the autopsy on that piece. They've done enough due diligence and they had a plan for some development or, or am I misstating the facts? No, I need to, I need to get some more information. Um, but the, the feedback I got from them was after discussing with zoning attorneys who are familiar with the village, um, and gave them feedback on their plan, uh, which was you're, you're, you're gonna have a very difficult time getting support from the village. It's probably gonna be an uphill battle. Um, they just, they made the decision, look, we don't want to, we don't want to have challenges. We don't want to, um, uh, we want to collaborate. We want to work with villages and we want to work together uh, for a project that will be supported. And so they told me, look, we just don't want to, we, we have so many other projects in villages where we have TIFs and we have, support and we have uh, villages who are welcoming our projects into town. Um, they said, those are the projects we want to spend our time and resources on. We don't, we don't want to be in a situation where we're, you know, having um, uh, just multiple meetings and, 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 and lack of support. And um, so, so that's really it. Again, I've only had quick conversation in an email yesterday. I need to get a little more information as to why they made that decision, but in their mind, they felt that the challenges were too great to get a uh, the concept plan that they developed. They felt it would be too difficult to get those approvals in Long Grove. And the concept so, plan was for 160 residential units with um, a couple of acres of first floor retail. So is, is that, if they moved on or if the alternatives uh, and, and flexibility from the village and or the TIF would have come true are they still interested or they're going um they're technically what the problems are it's not even necessarily traffic pattern but that's a gateway piece to tie in the the, uh, downtown area you started out this discussion with that that's a gateway piece to tie in uh and close up that gap between buffalo grove and and in recent i mean the the timing sounds like it's almost a setup but in recent events they said they're off the table. Are they back on the table? If in fact there was more uh, ability to execute the plan as they as they propose, or, uh, that's what I'm trying to. Yeah, say. so that that's it's funny you say that. That's the exact that's the exact conversation that I want to have with them today. It's uh, hey, look, you know, if we can have if we can take this a little further and have some conversations, let's do that and try to keep the deal alive. So. That's on my plate literally today to reach out to that developer and find out if they would stay. And I frankly, I think they would. 
Yeah, I think they would if there was some, Hi. if they got some positive feedback. Yes. Hey, Brian. So yes. What if, so, and again, and I think we've got, we're lucky enough to have two board members, trustees on, on the call this morning with us. But I mean, I think, I mean, I, I think at that point, just from a, the 162 residential units, I think is probably what's going to scare most of our trustees away from something like that. But for fun, if, um, so you were saying earlier, if we had a very pointed marketing and very pointed idea or a concept for every parcel of land, but specifically on that South 15 acres that you're representing on 53 and 83, if we said it could be, it, it should accommodate or could accommodate X number of residential and this much retail and made it a little bit easier for a developer to say, okay, yes or no, because I'm, I'm like you, my clients just want to know immediately. They don't want to drag it out for a year to get to know. So if you do something like that, do you think perhaps, you know, your client might be interested in something like that? If, I mean, and again, I'm not, I'm, I'm not going to put words in the board's mouth, but maybe that's something that, you know, the board can look at in the future for how to help market some of these sites to get them Oh, I mean, do you think that would help you? Yes, I do. I, I think it would. A, a more clear path and something that is, is um, you know, that adheres to market conditions, right? Um, so, it, I mean, if we said we'll let you do, you know, uh, you know, ten residential single-family homes, but we want two hundred thousand square feet of retail, I mean, that's just never going to happen, right? But if if there is a plan that adheres to market conditions, and we said, look, if this is generally kind of what a developer comes in and proposes, we're all, we're behind it. I think that goes a long way. And I would, I'm, I'm happy to, um, I'm not sure who are the board, board members are on the call, but I'd be happy to share with everyone on the call the concept plan that this contract purchaser um, created. And I'd love to hear feedback on it, you know, good, bad, or, or indifferent. I mean, that, the, the more feedback we get, the better off we are to get either this group back engaged or the next group more clear path to how to get uh, their entitlements. So again, I'm happy to share that with, with everybody and I'd, I'd love any feedback that anyone has on it. One of the pieces there was the, do you have the control of that land for sale by the seller? One of the problems there was there was some discourse between sellers across time. Have those sellers given you the option to sell that land at a certain market price that makes sense? Uh, cohesively or because that, because at the disclosure, I own Sunset Grove next to it. So uh, in that okay. regard, um, but there's always been some issues with uh, the cohesiveness of that group. You have a firm ability to sell that. They've all agreed that, that those games are over. Yeah, that's they, a good they, question, Jay. Um, and uh, not to get into, you know, too, too many details, um, but the short answer is yes. Um, the partners of the property, and I don't know all the details, but the, um, the partnership that owns the property now, uh, I think there's a third partner who's out, and now the two partners who own it are fully on board, have the ability to sell. We have an exclusive, exclusive agreement with them to sell, and to take it a step further, they're motivated. And um, you know, a lot of times I take on listings and we have unreasonable sellers, and it's just going to be nearly impossible to sell it because of their expectations. I would say that uh, ownership group has the ability to sell it and they're motivated and understand the market conditions uh, and are open to doing a deal at, at market value. Yes. And the buyer, and the existing buyer who's walked from the table in short order has the ability to be uh, re, re exposed to that property. Absolutely. Yeah. This is a, a developer that I know very well. Um, they, yeah, I'm going to have further discussions with them and the ownership even said, please do so. Please have further discussions and see if there's something that we can do to bring them back to the table. So, um, that was on my plate to do on the balance of the week. And, and if it's not them, I, I there's some others who have expressed some interest as well. And the access point to that piece, you know, is also accessible uh, through the, uh, uh, access at the stoplight, uh, from Robert Parker. You appreciate that there's, yes. there's some yes. ability just between the parties involved between the village and myself to grant that type of access. Yes, I think there's an easement already in place, correct? Um, I, I don't want to speak. Uh, okay. Very well might be. Yeah. My memory yeah. of yeah. different. But I, be I believe, yes. that, well, or the parties involved 
There certainly needs to be that right. gets up to that piece. I can tell you that the actual piece where the uh, office building is, that easement behind that is, is controlled by Sunset uh, Grove. Yes, well, yes. And Brian, that's the, and I'll, again, I'll share the plan with you and you'll, that's the way they had designed that with the access coming in from the north and not touching the 8353 access, just leaving that closed off because uh, our feedback was that IDOT would, would never allow it. Uh, Brian, you said there were some other possibilities. Are they similar to the ones that um, were under that contract that may or may not go through? Yeah, another good question. I, yes, the, 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 all the interest that we've received has been from um, residential developers. Okay. And, 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 you know, most of them would be willing to do a small component of retail you know they don't they don't love it they don't think there's a market there for it but if it if it made the deal and got support they could they would carve off maybe an acre two acres uh, kind of on that north end on the frontage of 83 but uh, the concern there is that there's just not a market you know you're going to build the retail and it's going to sit vacant um does, does anyone know off the top of their head what um the current master plan was for that site and because I thought it was also mixed use retail and residential and maybe I'm completely and I can't seem to find my comprehensive plan documents to see but does anyone know off the top of their head maybe we can help Brian you know make this a productive call for him too um what that's zoned or what how that's master planned out well if we can't find it right now I'm sure we can find it within a fairly short time and pass it along uh, I just, we're in a, we're in a kind of tricky position, Brian, in the sense that we're a volunteer committee and we have literally no power in terms of the process of bringing things into the village. We do, however, uh, we have in the past written reports to the village trustees suggesting that we thought that a use was a good use or a bad use. And um, my recollection is that this group has been talking about, well, I know we've been talking about this parcel for a long time and has been a long way toward favorable for non-retail development, not nursing homes, but you know, something in terms of townhomes short of having five-story apartment buildings in there. Uh, it seems to make a long-term sense. Yes, right away, we're not going to get retail and sales tax and all that good stuff, but in the big picture of the village and where it's going to go in 10, 15 years, the village is graying. And the, the yeah, so, so yeah, um, we can't say much in terms of, oh yeah, this is great, but we certainly would like sure. to continue to um, help this, if it's a possibility, become a possibility that works. We can uh, do some things along those lines. I appreciate that. And, that, and that's, that's why I suggested earlier, and I'd love to, to follow through on it, is to get you all the plan, that the, the concept plan that this group uh, developed. And I can disclose, it's the Urban Street Group was the, pro, was the, uh, the, the developers that had it on a contract. Uh, you're probably familiar with the old Motorola campus in Schaumburg, where they now have a Top Golf there. They have DR Hortons doing for sale row homes, and there's apartment building going up, and a senior, it's 100 acres. This is the same group um, uh, who's doing that project, uh, had the property under contract. So, Brian, so they're uh, capable. So Brian, um, I, I know you have another, I think you have one other parcel in Long Grove, if I'm not mistaken. So is that the one off of Old McHenry and 22? No. Yes, Old, the, yep, yep, yes, yes. Okay. The Landau farm at the Northeast corner of 22 and Old McHenry. And have you gotten any interest on any of those? Um, and, and that property at all? Or is there anything that we could do maybe again, just so that I think part of this is we're trying to um, educate our EDC group and, and, and see that like what else we can do to, to help drive economic development and a, a, you know, a, a broker like such as yourself, I think helps educate a lot of our uh, membership, basically um, our volunteers to see like maybe what, maybe we can tickle, maybe some of the board of trustees and, or, you know, bring up to light, like what interest maybe you have gotten or what you see as a best use based on kind of like, I, I love what you said about, 
you know, based on the market trends and, and there's no way we're ever going to get huge, large retail at the South 15 that you, the 8353 site. But so do you have anything similar for the other site that you represent? Yeah, the, the other site, it's a good, good site. It's not as, um, you know, the, the traffic counts and the accessibility is not as good as route 53 and 83, but it's still at a great corner. I mean, um, uh, I frankly, I think if the village was open to a gas station on that hard corner, it could we could have three or three to five offers on it, you know, tomorrow. But um, you know, the the assumption and the feedback has been that that's not going to be supported, which I get, I understand. Um, and I think the balance of it um, could be more traditional residential. So I, if you're familiar with the on old in kill on the Kildeer side, you know, and, and this is kind of a good example, Kildeer on Old McHenry, uh, MI Homes is doing development there. And then they're also doing development on Route 22. Um, that was a unique project for Kildare. Kildare never allowed any um, attached residential product prior to that. And MI Homes is now doing duplexes, not, not a ton, but a fair, a couple of duplexes on the Route 22 uh, property. And then also on the uh, old McHenry property. So MI Homes is about halfway through that development. Kildare approved that. And then Kildare, Kildare also recently approved on Route 12. Um, uh, they approved the Pulte Homes development on Route 12 on the piece that had been for sale for a very long time, north of Quinton. North of Quinton, or was it Cuba? Cuba and Route 12. Um, okay. So, you know, and I, I've had a number of conversations with Mike Talbot over there, who's the village administrator, and he told me, um, a couple of years ago, he said, look, you know, three quarters of our village's budget come from the sales tax revenue along Route 12. And he said, times were great. And we were generating a tremendous amount of, of money from that. Well, then the market changed. And he said, we were, we were hurting. And a lot of those vacant spaces you know, were causing us budgetary issues at the village. So he said, we took a more open-minded approach. And now they've approved some some of these builders to come into town, a Pulte Homes and MI Homes. So, so they've kind of adapted a little bit to that. And, you know, I have another piece at um, Long Grove Road and Route 12. Again, it's in Long Grove, it's in Kildare. Um, and they've said, look, we're open to a variety of uses, whether it be apartments or senior housing or a combination of mixed use. Now there's plenty of other issues with the property. It's got wetlands, floodplain, access issues, utilities and everything, trees, mature trees on the property. But um, but there's at least some 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 willingness to consider uses that may not have been a good fit just five years ago um, because of the market conditions that that have are continuing to change. Um, but but sorry, I mean I yeah on that piece um, not a tremendous amount of in, of interest in that piece. I think the hard corner again could be sold off to a traditional retailer fairly quickly, but. Um, I think the, the conclusion has been that that's not going to be supported. Um, so they, they, some of these developers move on to other sites. Um, so I just pulled up the, um, at least I found the draft version of that area, the, the 8353. And it looks like uh, 1120, 28 units total was some of the um, co initial, as part of the comprehensive plan, I, that, the, I have the draft version. I'll have to look for the the final, but I don't think it changed much. But I saw 28 units total. Um, it was mixed use office or commercial with attached single family with residential above. That was 1.2 acres with nine dwelling units. Um, and then there was a mixed use commercial with attached single family residential above. Um, another 11 dwelling units. That was 1.5 acres. And then there was a cluster single family residential, 4.1 acres with eight dwelling units, so two acres each. Um, so we're still doing, I mean, the uh, smaller units are typically, it's atypical of our usual one, two or three zoning, R one, two and three, um, but that's just the one I found um, of the draft. And I don't think it changed much from um, the other one. I mean, I could be wrong. Hold on. No, I think that's the right one. Um, but anyway, any other, and Brian, I know we're, we've taken a lot of your time. Anyone else have any other that's questions fine. for Brian? 
Fine, I'd like to ask you another question. You just threw out some ideas about on 22 in um, the cross street over there with a the right. gas station. Now, forget, forget about the details. Right. What, what if a gas station went up there? What other uses could, could suddenly stimulate additional benefit to the village around that area? So there's a decent sized vacant land around there, correct? That's a decent sized piece. Sure, yeah, it, it's about, jeez, uh, I should know off the top. I think it's 30 acres, but there's a good portion of that at the north end that's the creek kind of cuts through it. So you're going to lose, um, you know, I, I would say maybe 20 of those acres are buildable because uh, any developer is probably going to want to stay away from the, the floodplain on the north end. And it actually would add as a nice buffer to the residential to the north. But um, I would say that if you did get a, um, we're open-minded to a gas use there. I mean, that could generate other sales tax revenue drivers because it's going to generate traffic, right? So, um, you know, it's still not going to be a large scale big box, but I, I would envision a gas station with maybe two or three other pad sites um, where you could get, you know, drive through restaurants or other retailers or maybe a bank or kind of similar uses to across the street, but but a more traditional type development without lots on the frontage, gas station on the hard corner. Um you know, like you could probably pull a, a something like a Dunkin' Donuts or a Starbucks or oh, you have you know, a Dunkin' Donuts. Or, yeah, you have an existing right. Dunkin' Donuts. But right, if you put right. that so something if you similar put those to that. Two, if you put those two pieces together, would that could that become a major sales tax generator? Uh, yeah, uh, sure. Between, a gas station between the, the and, secondary retenanting of where the Dunkin' Donuts is, because you're going to have more of a uh, two uses there tying into downtown village from the, from the north. Right. Right. And, and I mean, just a gas station alone, I, I could get you some some analysis on a gas station, but that could be a million dollar uh, sales tax generator annually for the village. And I can get you some some formulas that show that, you know, based on the amount of gas being sold and the C store operations. But that I'm happy to, to dig that up and share that with the group if you'd like. Um, and so I hold on. I'm going to just Brian, I was wrong about I was the wrong site. So. <laughs> So the site that you're working on, because you have the 15 acres only, right? Correct. All right. No, that's only co deemed commercial. And there's no residential at all on the, as of the current master plan. So I apologize for that. But I think that's okay. that's probably going to be a bigger issue, if anything, um, especially because now you just said there's no way. Because the proposed comprehensive plan at the time um, assumed an ingress off of 53, like a direct entry, but you just basically said that IDOT is, you know, no way um, that they would ever allow for something that kind of um, traffic. Yeah, and the reason for that is, so I've been told um, Urban Street talked to their traffic engineer, Louis Abuna, who's the best in the business. And he said, you know, I'm no expert, but the feedback I got was that IDOT ranks all these intersections according to the, you know, potential danger. Hmm. And that one, because it curves there, Right. That one apparently is kind of off the charts as far as it would be a pretty dangerous intersection if you made it full access. So they they basically said there's no way they're going to allow that to happen. Which is why we'll never be able to do full res full commercial as you as you mentioned, just purely based on that. Because you're right. Because I there's no way I, my, none of my commercial clients would ever look at a site that didn't have full ingress and egress, right. especially after the most directly traveled um, road. So, Correct. In which case, Correct. your recommendation would have been the mixed use or more residential. Correct. Right. If that was a full access, um, if that could be full access, that 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 could be. You know, I still don't think the whole property would be re retail, right. but it would open up. I think before right. I was involved, actually, the contract purchaser, I think they were proposing a gas station there, and that would have been fine because it's full access, lighted intersection. But when they found out, I heard when they found out that wasn't possible, they walked away. <laughs> That's a shame. Thank you. Um, honestly, then the only other the, the uh, area of Lake Cook Road, the new TIF district. Uh, you've ge generally commented about uh, you know some of the problems there with the with the access, etc. As it currently stands with Menards, uh, what can be done just to stimulate? That's certainly away from the major uh, residential portions of Long Grove currently. What could be done to stimulate revenue for the village from that general area? What would you visualize? Yeah, so I know that Menards is always a traditionally a pretty tough seller. Um, so I think the outlots that remain vacant there, 
it's probably a function of what they want for, for those pad sites. Um, I haven't been involved in, in any <laughs> dealings on those pad sites, but it's just known in the industry that, that they like, they'll sit and wait until they get their highest number possible. And if that takes 10 years, then they'll do that. So I'm sure they've had interest over the years, but if the economics aren't, don't meet their thresholds, they're, they're going to sit on them. Um, there, I've, I've seen numerous occasions with for on Menards owning vacant piece of properties, owning out lots and just waiting and waiting and waiting until they get their number. So I think that's a function of owner's expectations on at least the Menards piece. Um, so I don't know if that answers your question or not, Jay. How about putting how about putting distribution on the uh, Geimer piece? On the which piece? Piece not the piece north of Menards, off of Fifty Three. I think that could be you know in that location, given the proximity to the Fifty Three extension there, or the, the Route Fifty Three dead end of Lake Cook. I think that would be, I think the, there could be a tremendous amount of interest for that. I mean, I gave you the example of that piece in Vernon Hills. And that's on, you know, this piece that you're describing, frankly, would be a better, better access to major highways than the piece in Vernon Hills. Uh, and that piece was gobbled up immediately by a industrial developer. Um, now, 290 or 94, 294 is probably a better, um, a better route to be on for the industrial users. But, you know, 53 is equally is not equally, but 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 strong location to be at as well. I think that could probably fly and you could generate some interest if you were open to that type of use there. How about a sales tax generator of a gas station around that? Uh, at that location, I, I'm trying to think, as long as there's a lighted intersection with good access and because you're on the Lake County side, I think a gas station would be very desirable there. Um, simply because you're right across the Cook County border. Uh, it would just be a function. I'm trying to visualize the piece, you know, where that would be, you know, I don't know if that's a wet area at the Northwest corner. Which one are you talking uh, about? Of, which, which parcel? Uh, the parcel directly North of uh, Menards. So Jay, 15, is that 15, 15, oh, directly north. it's 14 uh, acres, that one. Correct. Yeah, that would that, oh, that generate a million bucks in a sales tax for the village? So okay, you're talking so about directly sales tax. north. Yeah. So it's currently, um, yeah, it's in this map. It looks like it's it's um, it just says specialty business slash production. Hundred uh, fourteen acres, one hundred twenty-two thousand square foot. Um, gross. Uh, but yeah, so it's. Um, Right before the soccer fields, or that might be the sack. You no, know, hold on. Yeah, it's right before the soccer fields, it looks like. Yeah, and I think that might be a tougher putt there being north. I, I think you would need, I don't know if the, I'd have to look at the traffic counts, but I'm not sure. Actually, I can do it while we're doing this. Um, the, the lot maybe, right in front of Menards yeah. would be amazing because that lot is. Like it's right on the corner of Lake Cook and 53. It's on the northwest corner of 53. No, I'm sorry, northeast right. corner of 53. That one is. But your access is a little tricky. You know, the main access to Menards is further up uh, on, on, right. on Hicks or Old 53. And then there's really no access on Lake Cook, I don't think. So that Although would be. There was a, I mean, on the master plan, there's like a possible ingress directly from Lake Cook. But again, okay. whether I thought would allow something like that would be interesting. Yeah, I think a gas station on one of those, if you can get an access point on Lake Cook, which I, you know, I don't know, might be tough given the ramp. I and then has, given I the thought, intersection, it is just. I dot has already said no. Uh, okay. Well, nothing, nothing off of that ramp will they consider. Yeah, nothing. I'm not too surprised by that. That's too close. The, the ramp is too close to the intersection. So I get that, and the traffic there is, is pretty immense when, uh, at, at peak hours. So I, I understand that. But you know, if you did something at the northwest corner of Lake Cook and 53, you know, I know there's some some wetlands there, but that that would be an ideal place for a gas station as well. 
Yeah, large format retail or distribution is currently what it's kind of planned for. Is that, a, is that in Longwell? Is that in a, is that corner in the uh, municipal? It's in our I think I think it's in our it is? Wow. I think so. Hold on, I could be wrong. No, no, it isn't. Oh, bummer. Uh, it's not in Long Grove. And again, you were talking about one wait, million dollars of G. Uh, wait, but that's in our master plan. I, I'm looking at this lot G, like directly across the street. It looks like it's it's, it's in our Long Grove Lake Cook Road sub area site five. That I mean, I could be looking. We could be talking about two different pieces of property. I was looking at what was sub like sub site five, sub area site plan five, area G. That's purple. Find right. a gas station in those areas. Forget about a gas station. One million dollars of net revenue for the village, or is that, or or is it, is that what you said before? Yeah, some of the ones that the high volume ones at good lighted locations can have the ability to generate that amount of money directly to so the, generate four hundred thousand almost guaranteed two to four hundred thousand. I think so, and I can get you the numbers. I can get that for you. Yeah, Brian, would you get those for us? That would be just good. Sure. Yeah. And again, I don't know what the, the village's appetite is for gas stations, but I know we talked about that with the Sunset Grove Valley Bunyan site that one time, Jay, a couple of years ago. Roger, I have to sign off. All right, Erwin, thank Thanks, you. Erwin. Yeah. So, Brian, we were totally gone over. Sorry, we we're- um, That's fine. No, I'm fine. Okay. Um, but yeah, I mean, so that's, anyone else have any other questions for everyone, just to get everyone, <laughs> be mindful of everyone's time? No? Um, Brian, thank you so much. If you wouldn't mind anything you can share would be cool, yeah. great. And then um, especially related to, you know, maybe your client and or um, and the um, possibilities of a gas station and how much it might generate. Uh, again, yes. even like the perfect world scenario, it'd just be good for us to be educated on those kinds of numbers. And, and you know, and again, maybe we can, you know, tee up or ask the board how they would feel about a gas station in certain parts or. Well, if you, if even just one thing hit across all of it, you know, how many years are left on the TIF? Uh, 83 and 53. The, the 13, I think it's, I think we're down to 12 or 13 on the, um, on yours, on the Sunset Grove, if I'm not mistaken. I, I'd have to go back and look. Which is the know. same as the South 15. Uh, yeah. Correct. Brian, you're on it. I could be wrong. I mean, Brian, I could, you, it might be buyer, less than buyer, that. Your buyer knew there was 12 years left on the TIF, is that correct? Yes. On the 83 piece. Yes. And, and, uh, and that yes. had some positive, that had some positive, uh, value for them too, I think it. A little bit, yeah. Residential is not as impactful, but there still would be a fairly decent increment because right now I think the taxes are next to nothing on, on that. Agricultural. That's agricultural. Right. right, it's agricultural, yeah. Um, I'm double checking on when it ends, hold on. Hmm. Okay, well, while I'm looking. Well, that's been a, Brian, you've been a real big uh, help to just a hundred percent the worst case scenario, none of these things work out. The best case scenario, you've spurred a lot of uh, conversation in regards to the possibilities of the value. Um, so, it ends in 2030. Like, Sorry, it, it's actually I appreciate 20, you having 2030 me. 2030 is when it ends the TIF. So, okay. Yeah, thank you so, so much, Brian. Too. I appreciate um, and you and I can chat again offline sometime. Yeah, no, anytime. Thank you for having me. And if you have any questions of me, please reach out. And in the meantime, I'll gather up some of those things that we discussed and uh, get it out to the group. Thank you so much, Brian. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank Take you. care, everyone. Bye-bye. Take care, Brian. Thanks. Thank you, Roger. All right, we, we still everybody. have a quorum. <laughs> yep. Barely. We but, barely uh, have a quorum. Yep. So, so formally, can we get a motion to adjourn and then we can wipe up? I move to adjourn the meeting. And I bet there's a second. Yes. I'll second. There you go. Uh, any opposed? Didn't think so. That was, uh, let me stop the recording. All right.